There's a story of a student of a Zen teacher from the Midwest who's going to come out to L.A. to try his hand at the entertainment industry. And the teacher asked him, if you go out there and they knock you down, what are you going to do? And the student said, well, I guess I'll have to accept it. And the teacher said, no, they knock you down, you come back up. They knock you down again, you come back up again. This is the attitude you have to take as a meditator. When things don't go well, you have to get back up and get back up on your feet and do your best. And this applies to the meditation and to your life outside. After all, we are working on our own well-being here. and We can't let other people get in the way of that. That doesn't mean that our well-being has to trample over their well-being. But it does mean we can't let their idea of well-being trample over ours, because after all, we are living in the land of wrong view. And even over in Asia, there are cultures that have been living with Buddhism for hundreds of years. All too often when you step outside of the monastery, you're stepping into a land of wrong view, too. I know a number of people in Thailand who are complaining. They worked in the government, they worked in business. And they made the point to try to be as fair and as moral as possible in their work. Sometimes their fellow workers would say, why don't you just go back to the monastery? <laughs> and even in monasteries, it's not the case that everybody around you is going to have right view. People have all kinds of views. And even when you're surrounded by people of right view and the right practice, you still have to be a self-starter. They can't do the work for you. So it means that wherever you go as a practitioner, you've made up your mind you're going to do this. This is something you want to stick to because it's your decision and you know the decision is right. I have a student who was going across Russia one time on the Trans-Siberian Railway. And he said they stopped near Lake Baikal. And he'd been reflecting, sitting there in the train, going across those vast expanses, reflecting on human life and both what he saw around him and what he had left behind in the States. And he came with this overwhelming sense that the very few people in the world have a good moral attitude. And he found it depressing, but then he realized I can at least be a moral person myself, regardless of what other people think, what other people say, whatever they believe. I can make that my decision. And that gave him a sense of energy and a sense of honor. So whatever way you find it, motivating yourself to start with the practice and maintain the practice, it's all to the good. And then in maintaining it, it's not just a matter of the motivation. You also have to have some skills. And this is what we work on as we meditate, is to get a sense of what does it mean to have the mind really balanced? It's just not leaning over to its likes or leaning over to its dislikes, or leaning over to delusion, or leaning over to fear. And as the Buddha said, there are four ways that the mind gets biased. Either things you like, things you dislike, things you're deluded about and things you're afraid of. You don't want the mind to be leaning in those directions. You want it to stand tall, balanced. And part of that just comes from the conviction that you know, at least you trust, that what the Buddha taught was right. And it seems reasonable and it seems good. You're going to be testing that. Of course, people will be testing you. But you want to have to be able to maintain that conviction that this is the right way. Because many people have followed this way and they've come back and say, yep, this is the way to true happiness. So you can't let yourself get waylaid by other people's opinions. And you never know, sometimes you're a good example can help change them. You've got to have goodwill for everybody around you, even the people who are opposed to your practice, where people 
trying to put obstacles in your way. You can have ill will for anybody, but that doesn't mean you have to give in to their attitudes. So this is one of the reasons why we meditate, is to have the strength to stick with our convictions. To have a sense of well-being inside, because all too often the reason we go after other people's opinions is there's a sense of well-being that comes from other people's approval, or what we feel is other people's understanding. And it really depends on the other people. As the Buddha said, you do want to look good in the eyes of the wise. That's how he has you use a sense of honor in the practice. That's what honor means. Is having a sense of how you look in other people's eyes, and you want it to be good. Now, honor has gotten a bad name here in the States. You have people whose honor is besmirched just simply because someone makes a snide comment about them or their, the people they love, and they feel they have to defend their honor by killing the person. That's not honor in the Buddhist sense. As the Buddha saw, the problem with honor is not so much wanting to look good in other people's eyes, but wanting to look good in the wrong people's eyes. He himself had to put up with a lot of people who were opposed to what he was doing. Praise that led in the wrong dire direction, criticism that led in the wrong direction. When he started with his first two teachers, they praised him. They were going to make him teacher. But he realized that the skill he had learned under them was not the end of suffering, so he wanted to find something better. So he didn't let their praise turn his head. And then when he did his austerities, and after six years realized that that was a dead-end path, he abandoned his austerities. Then the five brethren who had been attending to him criticized him and showed a lot of disrespect for him and left. But he didn't let that turn his head either. But then once he had found the true way, it established the Sangha of noble disciples that also found the true way. He realized that he had established a society of people who, whose eyes you really do want to look good in. And you see this in many of his teachings. He taught the Kalamas that when you judge a teaching, you judge it as to what, when you put it into practice, what are the results. And also the question is this particular action that's inspired by these teachings is this something that's praised by the wise or criticized by the wise. The opinion of the wise is something to take into consideration. So when he talks about the precepts that are dear to the noble ones or appealing to the noble ones, those are the precepts you want to follow. There's even that reflection he gives. That when your mind is beginning to wander off in ways that it shouldn't be. He says, remind yourself there are people in the world, or devas in the world, human beings, who can read minds. What if they're reading your mind right now? What would they think? And it's not, not as far-fetched as it may sound. Staying with the John Fu, I had a very strong sense that he could read my mind, which kept me on my toes. And it was really good for my practice. You know the famous teaching where the, the Buddha is teaching Rahula. He starts out with the image of the, the empty dipper. If you, if you tell a lie, your goodness is as empty as this empty dipper. Its goodness has been thrown away like the water in the dipper has been thrown away. He's basically telling Rahula, this is what you look like in the eyes of the wise if you tell a lie without feeling a sense of shame. And then he gives the image of the mirror. And of course, what is a mirror if not something we look into so we see how we look to other people? And here the Buddha says you're looking in the mirror not of, to see your face, but to see how your actions look. When wise people are looking at you, this is what they look at. They don't look at your personal appearance, they look at your actions. And even that image of the elephant, you probably know what the Buddha is talking about, the 
he says there's an elephant who goes into battle and it fights with its forefeet and it fights with its back feet and it fights with its tusks, but it holds a trunk back. And the elephant trainer sees that and he says, okay, the elephant hasn't given his life to the king. But if the elephant fights with its forefeet and its back feet and its tusks and its trunk, then the elephant trainer knows, okay, this elephant has given its life to the king, there's nothing it won't do. Now, at first glance, the image sounds like it's the elephant who's not protecting his trunk is the one that you, that, that you would admire. He's really given himself over to the battle, because after all, that's what kings look for in their elephants. But actually, the image of the elephant who holds his trunk back, that's the one the Buddha admires. In other words, he say, if you maintain your sense of truthfulness in all situations, regardless Okay, that's when you're following his teachings. And what he's saying is if you maintain your truthfulness, regardless of what other people want, you're nobody's servant. After all, the elephant who's willing to risk his trunk for the king is the servant of the king. But when you practice the Dharma, you're nobody's servant. Now, John Fuhrung made this comment many, many times. We're not anybody's servant, he would say. Nobody hired us to practice. Nobody even hired us to be born. We came of our own free will. So when we see the practice as a good thing, we stick with it. We don't abandon it to be anybody's slave. So there's a point of honor in sticking with the practice. That even though the people around you don't appreciate, it, appreciate the fact that you're truthful, that you have goodwill that you're generous and virtuous, and that you're doing your best to train the mind. How you look in their eyes doesn't really matter. Just keeping, keep in mind the fact, how would you look in the eyes of the wise? Because after all, those are the people you want to join. You want to become a wise person, too. It's like in John Munn, when he was accused of not following Thai customs eating only one meal a day, living in the forest, wearing robes that were made up of scraps. People said, you're not behaving in line with Thai customs or Laotian customs. He says, look, I'm behaving in line with the customs of the noble ones. If you want to become a noble one, you have to follow their customs. Same way if you want to be wise. You, Start by trying to look good in the eyes of the wise. And that sense of honor is one of the things that really can help keep you on the path. Now that alone won't do it. It has to be augmented by your concentration, because after all, if you're going to be giving up the satisfaction of the admiration of the people around you. You have to have something inside that keeps nourishing you. And this is one of the reasons why we practice concentration, so we can have that sense of well-being that we can tap into, that we can draw on, so that it can sustain us. So remember, you started on this path on your own, of your own free will. Well, try to keep on the path because it's a good path. And you don't want that original decision to be wiped out by anybody else's opinions. When you know that what you're doing is good and harmless, that's what you hold on to. That's how we survive in this land of wrong view. Not only survive, but thrive in the right sense of the word.